So now let's look at our final phylum of the nine representative phyla in the animal kingdom, Chordata, and this is the one that we're in. Now all chordates um, are going to have some characteristics that are common, and so we call these hallmarks. So the hallmarks of phylum Chordata are a dorsal hollow nerve cord, right? So this is we think of our spinal cord, right? A notochord which is a flexible supportive rod that's located between the digestive tract and the nerve cord. This, in fact, in uh, vertebrates like us, we have a backbone, this has evolved to be the discs, the soft tissue discs between each of the vertebrae, the cushioning discs. Um, in addition, we have a post-anal tail, a tail that is posterior to the anus, that is not extensive in humans, obviously. We have a tail bone, but not a true tail, um, but that idea is there. Most vertebrates that we're going to look at that we know are going to have, or most of the chordates that we're going to look at are actually vertebrates. There are some that aren't. So a tunicate is an example, a C-squirt is an example of a chordate, a chordata, a member of chordata that doesn't have a backbone, is an invertebrate. But most of the things that we're going to know and study um, are in fact vertebrates. They have a backbone and they have a skull. So think about segmentation. Think about those number of vertebrae, that repeating body plan that we see in, like, Annelida. Um, we certainly can see that here um, when you look at that skeletal system, in this case of a snake. Now, we're going to break it down into different classes. So, dumb, king, philip, phylum, can, class. And we're going to go from the simplest of classes. We evolved from uh, chordates in the oceans um, that then moved onto land, and we'll talk more about that in the lab. But we'll start with the fishes. And we'll look at three different classes um, of fishes the agnatha, which are the jawless fish. This is a picture of a lamprey. Um, is the only vertebrate that does not have a jaw. Um, it is parasitic. It attaches onto other fish and kind of uh, gnaws away at the scales on that fish until it bleeds and then it feeds off that blood. Now, Ignatha is a minority um, when it comes to the number of species out there because the jawed fish um, are by far the majority. And when you look at it from an evolutionary point of view, you can kind of start to piece together what anatomical features evolved into this jaw. And as we all know, having a jaw is just a great thing. So the jawed fishes can be broken down into two groups, those being the cartilaginous fish, class chondrichthyes, um, versus the bony fish, which are osteichthyes. So chondrichthyes, the cartilaginous fish, are the sharks, um, the rays, the, um, and the skates. Okay? And so they are classified, or they are characterized by poor eyesight. They have an excellent sense of smell. Um, they don't have what's called a swim bladder, nor do they have an operculum. So the easiest way to define those two structures is to look at them in bony fish, um, which are osteichthyes. And so if you look here at this uh, anatomy of a trout, osteichthyes, a bony fish, um, you can see that swim bladder. And that is an uh, organ in the middle of the fish that fills with gas. And that gives the fish buoyancy. Um, so it can float to the surface. It can... Um, hover in the water, so to speak, um, whereas chondrichthyes, sharks, they have to keep swimming, otherwise they suffocate or they sink. So sharks basically swim their entire lives. Now, the suffocation comes into play because as a shark moves through the water, water moves in through its mouth and over its gills. Now, in the bony fish, they have what's called an operculum. And the operculum is this bony plate, so you can see cut edge of operculum here up by the head of the fish. And that's the thing that moves in and out on the sides of the quote-unquote neck of the fish, and that constantly irrigates its gills with fresh water. And that is how a fish can hover in your fish tank and look at you, and the operculums will be moving, and then quote-unquote, it's getting oxygen from the water, whereas a, a cartilaginous fish would have to keep moving. All right? So those are some of the big differences between uh, the cartilaginous chondrichthyes and osteichthyes. And again, you'll be responsible um, for all these classes. Now, the cool thing about evolution is that we find all kinds of weird stuff um, that we think is extinct um, in many cases. And so this is one example that was recently found, the coelacanth. And so the coelacanth is a lobed-finned fish. And it's one of the few um, extant or living lobed-finned 
um, in this genus. And if you um, click on that link or copy that link into your browser, there's kind of a cool um, old commercial that references the coelacanth. And now that you know more about the coelacanth as what's thought to be extinct, um, it's much more entertaining. So we have the fishes. And again, fishes, um, plural, refers to different species. Fish is singular or plural when you're talking about the same species. So um, I'm trying to use proper English. Now the next class is amphibia. And amphibia means double life. So this class possesses adaptation for both the water and the land. And so we think of newts, salamanders, frogs, toads. These are all amphibians. And when you look at um, the variety there, it's quite extensive, as it is for most of these classes. But all kinds of cool chemical defenses in frogs, camouflage. But this idea of a dual life is there because the tadpole, um, the developing frog, is clearly adapted just to the water, where then as the limbs develop, that organism can move on to land. Now, it is still linked to the water um, because it has external fertilization. So these two frogs are um, copulating. The eggs are exuded by the female, and then the male um, puts out sperm right into the water. So it has to be in a liquid environment. Those eggs are like jelly. And so were they to be on land, they dry out. And then, of course, the tadpoles are adapted to water. They need to break out of the egg and swim. So amphibia is still very much linked to water. And as we move forward in our evolution, um, our increasing uh, complexity of different kinds of chordates, we're going to introduce the idea of the amniotic egg. And this is going to allow the reptiles then to move on to land. So the amniotic egg then is, has this external shell, which then contains fluid on the inside. So instead of being linked to the pond, you kind of bring the pond with you. So the evolution of the amniotic egg is going to free the reptiles from water for reproduction. And so you can see here a hatching reptile from that parchment-like egg. But it's waterproof, so there's water on the inside while that young reptile is developing. And again, the diversity of the reptiles is quite extensive. You think about turtles and tortoises, snakes, lizards, um, alligators, crocodiles, all reptiles. Now, the other thing that's interesting about reptiles is um, they're quote-unquote cold-blooded. So we talk about them as being ectothermic. And so ectothermic means that their body temperature is not internally controlled. Rather, their environment regulates their body temperature to a great extent. So this is when reptiles will fan themselves or sun themselves to increase their body temperature or hide in the shade to lower their body temperature and hence control their metabolism to a certain extent. This also is different as we break away into our next class of chordates. And this is class Aves, and these are the birds. So the birds now, instead of being ectothermic, are endothermic, as are the mammals, our last class. Ec or endothermic means that you can um, harness your metabolism to generate heat and maintain a constant body temperature. So whereas the feathers that we see um, that are ubiquitous to birds um, are used for flight and have become adapted to flight, were originally thought to evolve actually to help at, um, control body temperature as insulation. Now there are advantages to controlling body temperature because you can evolve your biochemistry to work optimally at that body temperature. And that allows you to go places um, where a reptile or an ectotherm cannot go. For example, north of the Arctic Circle, south of the Antarctic Circle. Do you find reptiles? Absolutely not. What do you find? You find mammals. You find birds. Because they're endothermic. They can generate their own heat. All right? So that brings us to our last class um, of the chordates, and that is class mammalia. This is the group that we're in. And we're going to break this down into three subgroups or orders. So there's order monotremata, the monotremes. So these are known as the prototherians. An example is the platypus. These are the egg-laying. Um, mammals. There's the order marsupialia. Um, these are the marsupials, also known as the metatherians. Examples of the kangaroo. These are the pouched mammals. They carry their babies around in a pouch um, as they develop. And then finally, there's the eutherians, the placentals. And these are what we are. Cats, bears, dogs, people. These are all um, eutherians. And so we develop internally in mom attached to a placenta. 
So you can see the monotremata, the egg-laying mammals, um, the duck-billed platypi. Um, they're awesome, incredibly unusual animal, though very cool. Um, the marsupials, again, the pouched mammals. Think about um, Australia has a tremendous um, uh, evolution of uh, the marsupials. So you're seeing the kangaroo, the koala. And then finally, the eutherians, where the young develop internally attached to a placenta. Um, again, working on evolution, thinking about um, convergent evolution, you can see the corresponding animals in the eutherians versus the marsupials as these different animals have occupied what we call, as we get into ecology, different niches, um, exploiting different resources in the environment. So in Australia, you might find the marsupial mole. In North America, you might find the regular mole. The sugar glider versus the flying squirrel. The wombat versus the woodchuck. The Tasmanian devil versus the wolverine. So on and so forth. Um, so again, evolution is working towards that best suited for a given environment. So if the environment is the same, you would expect similar characteristics to arise. So we'll leave it at that, and our next move as we move in, uh, forward on the class will be to our final section, and that is ecology.